Okay, can you hear me? Am I on? I hope so. Thank you, uh, Paul, for that uh, introduction, and, and thanks to the organisers, um, John and Anna, for getting me here, and, and particularly to the, to the Mitchell family for bringing me all the way from Adelaide, Australia. Uh, and thanks to you all for, for coming along and hanging around uh, this afternoon. So um, the area that uh, I'm going to talk about today is one of the areas that um, I've been interested in for a while, which is really the, the interaction between environmental change through time with the, the genomes that we can now measure in uh, ancient humans and other animals, uh, and, and including modern uh, groups, and uh, also the, the microbiomes, how all these three are interacting in an evolutionary dance, if you like, and how we can use the genomic information in particular to look at past environmental changes and their biological impacts on, uh, on the environment. While we've got um, quite increasingly detailed records of climactic change in the past produced by the geophysicists, there's often not a lot of uh, attempt to try and connect these environmental events with uh, what's actually happening biologically. And I'm going to talk about some of the examples where we're trying to test that at the moment to examine some of these records. That cave, incidentally, is one from uh, Chile, Patagonia, where um, the, uh, it's a Melodon cave, the ground sloth um, coprolites are largely what the floor of that cave is, is made of. It's about a two meters deep of coprolites, which you can still pick up, as many of the tourists do. So the period of time that I'll, I want to talk about, um, you've, you've seen uh, mentioned by both Matthias and David so far, is the, the Pleistocene, which is largely the last uh, two million years. Um, this is time across the bottom as, as millions of years uh, here for three, two, and one. Where are we? Here we go. Three, two, and one million years. Um, then uh, the last hundred, uh, hundreds of thousands of years uh, before the Holocene, which is the period that we're in now. Now, the point of this slide, you would have seen uh, many of them before, is the climactic variability that is characteristic of the Pleistocene, starting off with a roughly 41,000 year cycle, um, followed by a 100,000 year cycle, where the climate is going up and down dramatically. And it's hard for us to conceive just what climate change was like in the Pleistocene because we are used to this last 10,000 years. All human civilization, agriculture, everything that we know about now, uh, apart from the, the early hunter-gatherers as you've heard about today, is based on the premise and the environment of this constancy. And I think as a result of which, we get a very anthropomorphic view about what the environment is like and what climate change means. It means these little wiggles, like the, little, the last little ice age, this, this kind of small perturbation that is taking place. That's our concept of climate change. But you only have to step back beyond 10,000 years to enter this environment that all of the genomes that we're looking at evolved in. The last two million years was anything but constant. We are an anomaly, uh, which does make it interesting that we're trying to perturb the system um, because you would guess, looking at this record, that if anything was going to happen, normal service would be resumed, which is that. And the, 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 the dramatic extent of these changes, to give you an idea, as you come out of the Pleistocene uh, about 11,000 years ago and into the Holocene, that change is about 10 degrees centigrade, which is about a little bit of Fahrenheit. Um, and that's incredibly dramatic. Um, we know that it takes place in as little as 50 years. Increasingly, the evidence is that it may have been as short as 12. If you can imagine a 10 degree centigrade change, that's at the poles, admittedly, so the, the middle of the planet will be less, but in 12 years, as a concept about how fast and how dramatic these switches are in the Pleistocene, that's an extreme version that gives you an idea about what these animals and plants are dealing with, how these genomes are evolving in that period of time. Uh, furthermore, the other uh, key point is that these cycles repeat. I'm just zooming in here in the last 600,000 years. Uh, there's about 27 glacial cycles, roughly speaking. What I'm plotting here is carbon dioxide, um, just because it's, it's a, an important indicator. This is just tracking warm in yellow and cold in blue over the last 600,000 years, showing you the glacials and interglacials. The glacials, obviously, are the cold bits. The interglacials are the warm bits. Uh, in between these major switches between warming and cooling, whew, that was interesting, are smaller variants. You can see some of them here, which are, um, oh, I've got a very lively mouse. I'll switch to this, I think. 
Uh, you can see the, the variation here. These are stadials and interstadials. These are small versions. They're not the wholesale change into an interglacial warming period, but they are little warming spikes. And I'm going to talk about what they do to megafauna uh, later on. This is the last glacial maximum. If I slip into jargon during my talk, I'll refer to it as LGM, but I'll try and avoid doing that. That's the last big um, expanse of the glaciers, about 20,000 years ago. And this is us here in the Holocene. So you can see the CO2, the carbon dioxide levels, are basically tracking what the global temperature is doing. They're often released by the warming of the methane deposits uh, in the north and under the sea. And so you can see they track quite nicely. The reason I put that on is because it's always interesting to show um, students and the like that where we are now, um, we just crossed um, 400 parts per million. Go world. Um, so here is, you know, this is the last 600,000 years of CO2 change. 400 parts per million is off the top of the chart. It's up about here. Uh, to give you an idea just how uh, extreme the carbon dioxide levels are in the world today. One of the things I find very disturbing about climate change, I'm a recent convert into the, uh, the physics behind this, how these systems work, they're fantastic, is how little the information about how these systems work is in the general um, uh, public arena. Uh, even the scientists, I could walk around uh, my building, a biological sciences building, and ask a couple of key questions about climate change, I would guarantee that not one biologist in the building would be able to answer them. So a very big disconnect between the two spheres of science, which I think is uh, very detrimental. I'm going to show you some of the um, kind of connections between them, which, which is why I think increasingly we have to start figuring on using our genomic data to look at what environmental change has been doing. Now, where do we go to get uh, records of the past? Well, uh, you will have heard about some of them today already from the other talks. Uh, this is a cave I've been working last year. We'll be working here again in, uh, this year, about four weeks. I'll be um, dropping down that shaft. This is uh, just the abseil pitch into a huge pile of uh, megafaunal bones. So you've got the American lion, uh, the American cheetah, uh, quite remarkable beast. The American lion's about 20% bigger than the African one, which is quite significant, full of horses and bison that have fallen in um, a very well-concealed entrance. I mean, I've seen a lot of caves in my time, and I almost fell on this one. You're just coming down a gentle, flat slope on a, on a ridge, and it, it drops away so quickly and is hidden by a slope that you're right on top of it before you see it. And as a result, you find a lot of um, herbivores with a ex surprised expression on their face, uh, often with carnivores right behind them, so that the cheetah <laughs> comes in in great numbers. Presumably, it's going too fast to stop. Uh, there's eagles around here. I never appreciated how big the American eagle was until you see the nests. They're all nesting um, in this, this ridge here. And so we just drop in. I've, I'm <laughs> in charge of safety, unfortunately, um, because of the background in, in, in rope work. So I've got to get 10 American paleontologists down that drop, which is easy, because down is easy. But back up again is, is more difficult at the end of the day without um, ending up with any lawsuits. So uh, that's, that's projects we're working on right now. Um, other caves which we um, are working in, I'll put this one in for the Near Eastern connection. This is the uh, RNE1 in Armenia, where we're looking at the world's oldest winery, actually, um, amongst other things. But it's, it's more like a Neolithic warehouse. There's huge storage pits in the ground full of um, grain uh, as well as wine, but there's wheat, there's barley, uh, almonds, a variety of things. It's a remarkable preservation. This, this cave is just layers upon layers of stored uh, goods. And we're studying the plant genomes of things like wheat and barley to look at how uh, they have uh, been selected um, through time by, um, by farming and then uh, expressing some of those uh, altered genes to, to find out their function. It's also the site of the world's, world's oldest shoe, if, uh, if you're interested. Um, again, just giving you an idea of the preservation that's available in some of these sites, quite remarkable. So it's about 5,500 years old. And you know, it's not far off a modern moccasin rig, um, quite quite impressive. So uh, while these caves give great preservation, the area we tend to do a lot of work in is, is, is where it's frozen. Um, because as you saw with Matthias, the cold uh, makes a huge difference. This is uh, the north slope of Alaska, so right up near um, the, the northern coast. Uh, that's obviously a mammoth bone. Um, and when I found it, I just I was walking along the riverbank looking for bison, which is what we're working on. And I could just see the head of the femur sticking out of the, the bank. Um, and I didn't actually really want a mammoth because we weren't working on them, but you figure that once you start digging one of these things out, you can't stop. Uh, it would be kind of rude. So it took 45 minutes, though, because the ground is frozen. It's not like you can just dig it straight out of the muck. 
But the preservation is quite remarkable uh, in these sites, and there's uh, hundreds of thousands of individuals. We can radiocarbonate each bone and get the DNA out and get an incredible survey of how populations have changed across space and time. The other area that we've started doing work is Antarctica. This I was here in January, and this is us drilling uh, a glacier in the West Antarctic ice shelf, where due to various conditions, the stratigraphy, the layers through time, have been turned sideways, so that as you walk across the glacier, you're going back from very old time at the edge here against the mountains, uh, back to the modern day. And this is us uh, sampling uh, cores, from which I'm taking microorganisms out to look at how the uh, Antarctic ice sheet has melted at different stages in the past, and particularly how that uh, impacts global climate. Uh, this we th we're starting to think increasingly that Antarctic ice melting is driving a lot of the major climate shifts I'll be talking about later on, certainly sea level changes. Uh, it's quite an impressive place to work. Um, you can see this is where we got dropped off um, by the aircraft. And then uh, we're basically using a, a corer here just to take out um, one to two meter uh, length cores, which I then had to melt and filter each night in a, in a tent, um, normally to about 12 or 1 in the morning, uh, which is quite a lot of work. I put this on because last night I noticed on the BBC there was a story that you might read about that the, the glaciers along this edge of Antarctica are melting incredibly quickly. They've just um, used using uh, satellite information. They're dumping out water at a fantastic rate. We were sampling right here at the base of this uh, ice sheet. Our, our campsite was in right at the edge of the Earth Mountains. So we're actually tracking uh, back in time, back about 100,000 years uh, that series of ice cores went, uh, the history of melting of this big chunk of ice, which right now is destabilizing. Uh, and it's pretty important to try and work out whether and how these ice shelves collapse because uh, they are responsible for huge climatic impacts and certainly sea level changes. I mean, if you are in New York, it's, it's fairly easy to calculate a one meter uh, sea level rise, which is what you're gonna get out of uh, one of these ice shelves going, would put you, um, the, the ground would be basically under the sea level, which would be quite impressive. So now, um, th those are the kind of sites that we're going to to measure the, um, the impacts uh, on, on biology. And what I'm actually doing with the, the cores at this site as I'm trying to test some of the physical models that they've got about how the ice forms and when it melts. They've got all these very complicated climatic uh, models, but no one so far has actually bothered to try and use the biology which is locked up in these records to test some of the alternate views on how this is stable or otherwise. And so what I'm measuring is the marine organisms that are being blown on to the, to the ice from the neighboring ocean. And so by tracking those marine organisms, I can tell when large chunks of fresh water are coming off Antarctica, uh, and, and therefore when melting was taking place. So also in deep time, um, I thought I'd throw up this photo. This is the Wilson Lab, circa 1989. Um, so about the time that, that Paul uh, passed through, with some very uh, dubious characters. There's Professor Derienzo here, uh, some of you right. I apologize for this photo, it was above my lab bench for many years bleaching in the sun, and uh, has at one stage been covered in soup, which is, per is part of my PhD research, I've splattered it. Uh, the photo was taken by Aaron Sido here, and I asked him for a new version of it, um, he was, he's been looking for one, and commented that if he didn't provide me with one, I was gonna show him covered in soup. Um, and he commented that it actually made him look very much like David Bowie, so he was actually quite happy with that, that, that presentation. But you've got Svante Pabo, Alan Wilson himself, uh, who was so instrumental in the research you've been hearing about today, really pioneering the use of molecules, proteins and, and DNA, to study evolution through time. Uh, here's the, the Perkin Elmer PCR machine, and uh, Svante and myself did all the ancient, some, this is some of the world's uh, earliest ancient DNA research, uh, 1989, was performed on the bench right behind that PCR machine, and our, our techniques for cleanliness were to put down new lab paper every day and to have a different set of pets. So the world has come a long way from, from trying to do ancient DNA research in a lab like this, and surprisingly getting reasonable results, versus the body suits, the separate positive air pressure laboratories that, that we now work in. Um, so but that's, that's where it all started, and, and where I met um, Anna, who, um, it was always asking me what it was like to be living in the antipodes, which is where, where I come from. So back, uh, back in those days, of course, it was all PCR, um, very simple techniques. The maximum kind of DNA that we were generating was only 100, 300 base pairs long. 
Uh, most of the work was looking at the uh, evolutionary history of extinct species, um, but it led to some famous uh, contaminated results, DNA from amber, the whole Jurassic Park theory, DNA from dinosaurs, from coal mines in um, Colorado, I think. Um, but I, I, we did also get the first genomes out, mitochondrial genomes. Uh, I put this up there because it was my postdoc, my first postdoc was to sequence 16,000 base pairs of two mowers done 200 base pairs or 300 base pairs at a time all the way around this genome. Uh, so that, <laughs> that was long and hard. And certainly compared to advances in PCR technology where we can multiplex and generate the mitochondrial genomes very rapidly, and we're doing this for all kinds of species, performing the first population surveys, to the big changes you've heard about where next generation sequencing has made it possible to, to generate billions of base pairs within single days. And suddenly we're now sequencing entire genomes for everything. So to go from this to this in one, you know, 25 years uh, is nothing short of revolutionary as, as you've heard. To give you an example of what you can do with the genomes, this is uh, a study on a mammoth that, uh, that David was involved in, just came out uh, fairly recently and study the population, the last surviving populations of mammoths, which was on uh, Wrangell Island, a small isol isolated island up here in the Barents Sea, and compared it to a, a mainland mammoth about 41,000 years ago. So the Wrangell population survived until about 4,000 years uh, ago. So they survived the big extinction 10,000 years ago, and most of the megafauna went extinct, but they only survived in this small island. Now what uh, happened here is they sequenced the genomes of these two individuals, one at 17x and one at 11x, uh, and then compared them to, to look at the history of this group. What they could see instantly was that the Wrangell um, specimen, because it was stuck on this island for a long period of time with hardly any individuals, shared large stretches of DNA that showed no diversity, um, a sign that the population was, was pretty small. Uh, as compared to the, to the mainland uh, population here, which all the way along this chromosome shows lots of diversity between the copies. Now, David referred before to the idea that your genome is basically a whole series of small chunks that have been recombined from your various parents. And you can use this information to calculate the population size of your species back into the past just using one genome. If you treat each one of those little chunks as an independent unit, and ask about the evolutionary history of that little piece, separate from the next bit, which has been recombined, and string them all together, you can get estimates of the historic population size at different times in the past. And they've done this here between the two um, mammoth genomes. So there's the, the mauve color is the mainland one, and the blue one is the Wrangell population. And you can track through time the estimate, estimated population size. And you can see there's a big bottleneck where the population collapses in size at this point. Um, which is about 180, 200,000 years ago. Uh, and then there's a recovery. And eventually, if you, if you look at the gray curve, which shows the relationship between both genomes, suddenly it stops at this point and goes infinite. The, the, the separation between the two becomes complete. And this is when they can identify that the, the ancestors of the population that led to the Wrangell guys and the ones on the mainland, they separated at that point. So you can use the genomic information to work out when the populations themselves are actually separated on the landscape, and also the actual size through time. Now the big advantage there is you can start relating that to climatic events. And what they point out here is this uh, Eemian interglacial, um, about 120,000 years ago, last major warm period, was what had previously been suggested had caused problems to the mammoth population. But their calculation is significantly different. And so they're suggesting that, that other causes were, were um, behind this. One of the big problems we've got with these calculations, though, is the molecular clock causes quite um, big errors as we go back in time. There are a large number of artifacts with, with these methods. So even though the, the actual skyline shape itself is very um, powerful, you, you do have to take the absolute amount of time occasionally um, with, with a bit of uh, a grain of salt. So these, these population sizes become quite important when you start looking at... Um, the environmental change and modern consequences. So I think it's, it's very important that we start using this genomic data to look at uh, events uh, that are recorded in it. And Australia, I'll just give you a quick example as to why, is a good example. The, the amount of diversity seen in these genomes has actually got a very direct modern day consequence. This is a Tasmanian devil uh, you may well have heard about, which is suffering a near fatal uh, disease, a transmissible cancer. 
which is quite unique. There's only uh, one other form in, in dogs, which is where by communicating, the Tasmanian devil communicates largely by, by biting things. And so whether it's eating, mating, or saying hello, it generally bites the other Tasmanian devil. Now, this cancer is passed during that uh, interaction and is rapidly spread throughout the population. So it's a, an out-and-out tumor, a cancer, but one that you can actually catch, which is quite significant. So this population is on its last legs. There's all sorts of efforts to try and preserve uh, the few remaining pockets that haven't been impacted by it. But you can see the tumors here, incredibly nasty. Now, the reason this cancer works this way is because the genome of the Tasmanian devil is incredibly similar between individuals. They can't actually tell the cell as being foreign from themselves. They're also inbred, would be one uh, explanation. Now, that's a high-profile case, but there's a number of others. Uh, this is the koala, which you've heard about already, uh, which has endemic chlamydia. Uh, it turns out the chlamydia is actually not the problem. It's the endogenous retrovirus that this thing is suffering from. So this is um, a really interesting case of a retrovirus that is actually writing itself into the genome, but is also still transmissible between individuals. So it's a really interesting evolutionary version. It's about to get trapped and become permanently stuck in the genome, but at the moment it's still hopping between individuals. And because of that retrovirus um, causing immunosuppression, the chlamydia is just a consequence. It comes out. And another one, the wombat. Um, which is just a ridiculous looking animal, but even more ridiculous here because it's got huge chunks of hair coming off due to mange. Not a very attractive disease, but uh, you know, if you're going to have one, uh, that is also sweeping through the population. Same problem in all these three animals. The amount of genomic diversity is incredibly limited, and we find it right the way across Australia. Something has happened to the Australian mammals uh, recently that has completely whacked them in terms of genomic diversity, and as a result, these diseases are, are wiping uh, through the populations very rapidly. The cause, we think, is climate change because it's, it's affected so many different species. And we've got some data suggesting it's before even the aboriginals arrive that we, that we see the lack of diversity. If you look at this map of Australia, basically anything which is brown and orange is effectively uh, a moving sand dune during the last glacial maximum. People think about the old geom as cold, but actually more accurately, it's dry um, because the, all the water is being locked up in the ice caps at the time. And at that point, this is largely mobile sand. Uh, Australia is just... Uh, a few small regions around the edge are actually inhabitable. And we think during this period of time, there's an enormous loss of uh, population diversity right the way across Australia, which means from a conservation biology perspective, those diseases you've just seen, you've got to be worried about them occurring um, in different forms for all Australian fauna. So that's, that's just a really a modern consequence of, of, of why genomic diversity, understanding what's causing uh, losses in diversity is so important. But I just want to talk about a couple of examples now going back uh, in time, looking at evolutionary adaptations to climate change. This is how some species have, have dealt with it. Here's a kind of a, a long-term response. The mammoth is, is a good model because it, was, uh, it comes from an elephant population. Uh, that, that, sorry, elephants in general have evolved in, in warm climates. It moved into the Arctic uh, about uh, two to three million years ago. So as a result, it's a warm animal adapted to warm conditions moving into an Arctic environment. So it's had to undergo some quite significant physiological adaptations. And so we were looking at um, hemoglobin, which we suspected would have undergone very strong selection uh, as the mammoth moved north. Now, hemoglobin is very important, um, particularly its response to temperature. This is why we get things like hypothermia. Um, our hemoglobin is uh, not particularly um, good at dealing with different temperatures. And so if you cool your core body strength, uh, uh, temperature, sorry, the hem your hemoglobin will actually get sticky and it will hold on to oxygen. It won't want to, to give it away to your peripheral tissues. One of the reasons that we get frostbite is, is an example, uh, but also hypothermia. So we're not particularly well adapted for cold conditions. Our, our hemoglobin certainly is not. So we figured that mammoths, if they're going to move into this environment, we're going to have to do something, and the hemoglobin was a, a pretty good candidate. So we, we sequenced the alpha and um, beta globin genes. In the case of the elephants, beta is actually a, a combined beta-delta uh, globin gene. And we did this from a 43,000-year-old uh, mammoth bone from, from Russia. What we found was a, a, a quite strange set of three uh, DNA changes in the mammoth beta globin 
uh, all of which led to changes in the amino acids. You don't really expect that. You expect a lot of DNA change not doing very much, and then a small number of uh, changes causing big protein effects. We found uh, three changes, all of which caused significant amino acid changes. When we looked at a model of the hemoglobin, what we've done here, it's a, it's a tetramer, so we've just set it up with the um, Asian elephant on one side, the woolly mammoth on the other, so you can see the changes between the two. Um, you can think of hemoglobin very um, grossly as, as a ha set of hamburger buns, and what they do is they rotate across one another um, so the oxygen can get in. Think of it as a, putting a meat patty between the, the two buns, which then lock and hold the oxygen in. The first amino acid change we saw, um, the, the glycine here, uh, at position 101, was completely unique. No other vertebrate has ever tried this. And, and hemoglobin, there's certain things you can change, but you don't want to muck with it too much. That hinge, that position, changes how the, the two um, parts of the hemoglobin slide over one another. It's huge. And what they do is they make it um, uh, very unstable when it doesn't have oxygen in place. So completely opposite to what we thought, that change makes the mammoth hemoglobin grab oxygen and hold on like no one's business. You're not getting the oxygen back off that molecule. Now, if you're going to go into a cold environment where you're already having trouble getting your oxygen to come off in your peripheral tissues, that would be the worst possible thing you could do. Now, there's two other changes. Both of them are changing amino acids that cause a series of positive charges to get reinforced along this binding face. Here's the African elephant, um, Asian elephant in comparison. You can see there's a big negative charge there. By changing these sites, the mammoth has dramatically increased the ability to bind chlorine, which is a, a standard effector for hemoglobin, and DPG, diphosphoglycerate, uh, uh, which, which are both things which interact with hemoglobin and modify its behavior. And so we looked at this and thought, this is bizarre. This is exactly the opposite of what you want to do if you're adapting to an Arctic environment. So we figured, OK, we better try and test this to see how such a change might occur. What might it be doing? And so what we did is take elephant, uh, Asian elephant um, uh, DNA and modified it to uh, make uh, a mammoth version. We expressed that in E. coli and got the, the bacteria to make the mammoth uh, protein, fully assembled the whole, the whole bit. You could just make mammoth um, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a very simple molecule in that regard. And then we tested that hemoglobin with a series of gases, which, which hemoglobin is known to interact with. Um, the effectors, things which bind to it, the chlorine, uh, DPG. And then we changed the temperature to see how the mammoth uh, might respond. And what we found was that the, the mammoth by itself, um, if you don't have anything else around it, the mammoth hemoglobin, is very sticky. And so you don't need much uh, oxygen for this to, to rapidly become saturated. It grabs all the oxygen and it holds on. Here's the red is what a, an Asian elephant looks like, but that doesn't sound good. But then if you add in the effectors, the things that bind to hemoglobin when you release the oxygen, and suddenly the uh, mammoth and the Asian elephant both behave about the same, which is great. So the end result is it looks like an Asian elephant. And you're thinking, why have you done that? Why have you done all that evolution um, and come up with a strategy to offset it? I mean, yeah, it looks great, but I mean, you don't need to be doing these kind of um, things with your hemoglobin. We started to wonder whether something was going on by adding on these additional effectors. There was some bonus point to go through all this horrible evolution to get back to the same physiology. There must be some point to this. And what we found was, if you look at the, um, the enthalpy, the change in energy involved in binding and releasing the oxygen, the, the larger the, the, the change, um, the more impact you will have if the blood goes up and down in temperature. It requires more energy to get the oxygen on and off. And as you add, um, you can see that by itself, the mammoth looks very much like the Asian elephant. No, no big difference in terms of basically grabbing um, the oxygen and releasing it. But as you add in the chlorine and then the DPG, you get a huge bonus effect. So it's becoming easier and easier to give oxygen away. And effectively, what you're doing is you're offsetting the energy needed to get oxygen off the molecule by binding chlorine and DPG onto the molecule. So them coming on board is releasing the energy to get the oxygen off. And so what we surmise um, is, although it's hard to test, of course, is that um, the mammoth could actually allow its peripheral tissues to cool down. You know, if, you stand, if you're the size of a house and you're standing on a flat Arctic slope with the wind blowing at you, uh, you lose a huge amount of energy trying to keep your tail warm to keep the, the oxygen going and, and, and stopping frostbite. 
Whereas with this hemoglobin, you can actually afford to let your tail cool right down because the hemoglobin is going to keep giving oxygen to the tissues and taking back the carbon dioxide like normal. So you've suddenly saved a whole bunch of energy you're pumping into your ears, your tail, all your peripheral tissues because you've come up with this engineering to allow um, a major energy saving. So that's just one example where the genomic information can be tested and expressed to actually see what are these adaptive potentials. I actually got asked this by the university, okay, what's, what's the adaptive potential in this? And, and some medics suggested, oh, well, when you do heart surgery, you have to cool people right down to, to zero degrees, so maybe we can put mammoth hemoglobin in them to keep them alive better. <laughs> it's like, that'll do, um, whatever. <laughs> I'm just interested in the evolution. It's, it's not my job to come up with a market, market for the, uh, the, the findings. So um, we, we've extended this kind of work um, through a number of different species. My favorite is the, the bison. This is the one that we've been working on for the longest. It's, it's our model organism. There's a huge number of species through space and time that have been described, or subspecies, probably most on very dubious grounds. Um, big morphological variation. You can see between the Alaskan form and the, the southern US form. Uh, huge size uh, changes through, through time. Uh, and they're very easy to get. These are the gold mines. So this is the work I do each summer. We go up to the um, Yukon on the border of Canada and Alaska. And the miners there are producing, as they're getting into the gold, they are removing the overburden, which has huge amounts of bone in it. Now, this is one uh, miner in one week putting aside bones because he knew that we were turning up. This kind of volume of material, uh, all of which will contain high quality DNA in them. So, uh, it's, a, it's an animal, a species that we can follow in great detail in terms of numbers of genomes, in terms of numbers of individuals across space and time. One of the things that we've started doing to try and explore why there's so many different forms and different species is to look at epigenetically modified sites. Because I think this is you know, one thing I didn't say before when we're looking at the temperature change, is those changes are so rapid and so dramatic that our normal concepts of how a species adapts to a new environment don't work. If you're changing even 50 years uh, time frame, uh, temperatures of that kind of swing, that's not enough time for Darwinian selection and increasing gene frequencies. It's just nowhere near it, and certainly if you get down to 20 or 30 years. And so one of the things I'm very interested in is if, whether the morphological variation you see in all these specimens is an epigenetic response. This is where you're turning on and off genes to rapidly change your, your um, phenotype without actually changing the DNA sequence itself. It's, it's fine tuning. Now, plants do this all the time, and the people studying plants have totally got their heads around the role of epigenetics. When it comes to animals, zoologists have been resisting this kind of Lamarckian concept that the, the, the adult or the individual can, can manipulate its, its phenotype so dramatically. But I think, in fact, and there's increasing evidence that, that animals do use it, certainly in laboratory situations, you yourselves use it on a daily basis. Your diet, your stress levels, you'll actually change quite dramatically uh, your epigenome, what, what genes you've turned on and off. Um, but there's, there's also more serious genes, genes which are involved um, in, in more core body development. And so what we, what we set out to do here was to compare the epigenome of a, of a modern cow a mummified specimen that I had for, from New Zealand, uh, and then permafrost bison. It's actually about 30,000 years old. And the way you show epigenetically modified loci is um, either a black or a white circle showing whether they've got a, um, a methyl group. This is how you turn on and off that loci um, next to, the, to a, a C and a G um, set of bases in a sequence. And so the, the, the black is, is, has got the methyl group sticking on it, the white does not. And so uh, this is what you expect in a, in a modern individual where some of the genes are um, uh, turned off, some of them are on, some of the sites. Uh, and we can see exactly the same type of patterns in an ancient bison as we can with, with modern cattle. And that's not surprising that this uh, methylation is a covalent bond. It's actually pretty strong. So it survived for, um, it turns out to be about 30,000 years. So we're now doing this kind of mapping uh, through those big climactic shifts that you saw before to try and see how much response the animal is using via an epigenetic uh, adaptation, just turning things on and off rapidly because the environment's suddenly got cold, but it's going to get hot again in 50 years. It's, it's going all over the place. As opposed to the standard model where you're actually doing genomic level change and then alleles increasing frequency, all the, all the standard type of stuff. So um, to, to give you an idea why I think that climate change is having such a big uh, impact, one of the things we can do is to, to look at all the different megafauna that have been sequenced so far. 
And we, we can use the radiocarbon dated uh, bones and the ancient DNA to look at when major changes have occurred. The first thing we find is that many of these changes you can't see in the fossil record because they're happening at a population level, sometimes even at the species level, but the species look so similar. So an example I'll give you here is European bison that we've been working on for a while. If you go to Europe and you, you pick up any old bison bone, and you're before about 52,000 years, uh, you'll have a new bison species. This is one that we found through DNA. To, if you look at the skeleton, none of the paleontologists had spotted anything. We're calling it bison X. I'd actually like to call it the Higgs bison, but um, I'm not entirely sure if, uh, if they'll let one, that one get through, but I think it would be rather appropriate. Uh, suddenly, between 52 and 29,000 years, all across Europe, we see your standard steppe bison, the thing that occurs across Russia and Alaska. Uh, that, that's all over the place, between 52 and 29,000. After 29, years, you're back to this. This species had gone through a massive bottleneck from here to here, had survived in some small place, but then comes in and sweeps across Europe again before finally it goes extinct at the Pleistocene-Holocene boundary when many of the megafauna go extinct. And your modern European bison, which you never would have heard about, but, but hangs out in Poland in small forests, that turns up and takes over bison bonassus. So we've got a completely unknown species mixed in with these uh, other populations. And from a skeletal perspective, from paleontology, they've all been grouped as one thing, just bison. Now, as a result of that, we can start asking questions, why, what's happening in the environment at the point when you switch from the, from the Higgs bison, I'll just practice saying it because it's fun, uh, versus the, the invasion. We can say that time point's important, this one's important, so is that and so is this. As long as we've got enough carbon dates in the series, we can estimate when these times are and then go looking at the climate record to see, or the environmental record, to see what might be causing it. And so that's what we've done. We've taken from that series five different time points. We didn't take this one because we don't have good carbon dates for when bison bonassus finally turns up. Now that's between species. You can also do it within one species. So cave bears in, in, in Germany are a nice example where up until 32,000 years ago in, in Germany, you've got one particular genetic type or clade which is suddenly rapidly replaced by another which lasts only about that long until the whole species goes extinct. So similarly, we can look at this time point, that time point, and the third, and say, why? Why then? What's happening? Now, if we plot this, and I've, I've taken every megafauna uh, species that I can find where there's large amounts of carbon dates and, and, and or DNA, and plotted them against climate, you get this really interesting pattern that I hope you can see. This is time across the bottom here from 56,000 years through to four. So here's the Holocene, this point. And here's the Pleistocene with the climate shifts that I've been talking about. This, this record here is oxygen and ice from Greenland. And so these are the uh, interstadial. See these big warming spikes shooting up, uh, followed by the cold snaps right afterwards. So these are the little small rapid variations. Now that starts to give you an idea about how fast and how often these temperatures are going up and going down. This is the bit that I think people fail to realize when, they, when you're talking about uh, the environment in which these genomes are evolving. This is just going all over the place. Now here's the LGM, the last glacial maximum, when it's relatively constant, but just very cold. Before we snap out of it at the end of the Pleistocene, we have one false attempt here, um, the uh, bolling alarod. You go back into the Younger Dryas, and then out finally into the Holocene, where we get stable. And that just shows you how abnormal this is versus that. Now, I've plotted from Greenland all the interstadials as these gray boxes. Right, that's what they are, and they're sitting right above the interstadials. There's an alternate climate record here, which I actually think is more accurate. Greenland, I think, has actually got errors in it. Uh, what we've done here is I've tuned the Greenland record to um, a marine basin, the Kariako Marine Basin, which itself is uh, absolutely dated by the Hulu Cave um, uranium series. Uh, and you can see there's actually some distinct shifts where um, Greenland, I think, has got um, errors. There's actually a paper out in Nature a couple of weeks ago um, confirming this. It doesn't make much odds. I mean, if you shift those gray boxes slightly sideways, what you can see from looking at that pattern is that the LGM here has got a big uh, deficit of extinction events. So that's what, that's what I'm plotting, I, sh I should explain further, is that for each species, so here's a cave bear, I'm plotting the last carbon date for that record from a whole series, so that's the red bar with the errors of the carbon date, I'm also using a method um, to try and estimate what the sampling error might be on that series of dates. So that's the black bar. That's a method to try and say, the last carbon date is not going to be the last individual. You're never going to find that. 
given all the carbon dates and all the series, what's the 95% confidence interval that you'd have whereby another individual could exist, but you've missed them? So that's why each group has got a black and a red version. The two different um, attempts are trying to define when that species or population goes extinct. What you can see, though, here's the stuff you know about, the, the last uh, mass extinction um, between the Pleistocene period and the Holocene, are all the, the, the common favorites, mammoths, um, giant elk, uh, cave li lions in America. They're all going extinct around this point in time. But during the LGM, we can't find one species that goes extinct. And yet the, the big cold snap that happens here is often held up as one of the reasons why the megafauna die out. Instead, what you see is all these different uh, populations and species are having major crises back during this period of time when we've got the very dramatic shark's tooth pattern of rapid warming followed by rapid cooling. And uh, the blue is from the old world. The, the black labels are from the new world. Just to show you that these, these species are distributed right around uh, the whole Arctic. And so we've done uh, statistical analyses on this distribution of all these um, populations. We've taken their time frames and the climate, uh, the longevity of, of both the warming periods and the cooling periods in white, and randomized them all to try and see how non-random is that distribution the overlap between the, the timing of these events and as far as we can see the warming. And what the statistical analyses show is that the warming events are definitely non-random with respect to the extinctions uh, of these populations and species. The cold periods, the white ones, are in fact random. Um, and you can actually see it yourself. I've stacked this up in a paleontological view where it's, it's cumulative over time. And you can see the connection between very marked interstadials and, and a stack of, of extinction uh, events at that time point. So I think this is uh, the first evidence we've really got that not only was climate change involved in the megafaunal extinctions, that they were staggered through time and space, but it was actually warming events, I think specifically the rapid climate change at the beginning of each warming event that seems to be associated with the um, collapse of these populations. Uh, cooling, on the other hand, doesn't seem to do anything. And the LGM is probably the best example we've got of that. Uh, long and cold is not problematic. Uh, I think what might be more important is variability itself. Anyway, so that's, we're trying to get that, uh, I've been trying to publish this for a couple of years now. Um, we were basing it originally on this new climate record which we developed. And the, the climate uh, researchers are about as contentious as, as the paleoanthropologists, as far as I can work out. So in the end, we gave up and we just used standard Greenland. And the pattern is exactly the same. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. And I wonder how much these similar sort of climatic uh, biological responses are hidden elsewhere in the fossil record as you go further back in time, but where you don't have the resolution or the DNA to spot these cryptic changes. So lastly, I'd like to just um, do a bit of an advert for a postdoc position that we're looking at uh, for the moment. But this is um, kind of building on what um, uh, David and, and Matthias and, and Christina have talked about so far. The ancient data which is produ being produced at ever-increasing speed uh, means that there's a huge number of genomes uh, and microbiomes that are now available for ancient specimens. So what we've created is an online um, repository for all these informations, uh, all, all these uh, genomes, and particularly the metadata associated with them, things like the carbon dates, how the libraries were created, how the sequencing was done, all the information that's actually very important, but often not attached to online, um, like uh, NCBI resources. We've got, with permission, kind permission from the authors who did the work, the raw sequences, the, the fast queue, the process files, um, BAM files, OTU tables in the case of the microbiomes and the variant calls, and we've stacked them all up. We've basically taken all that information, processed with the same set of software um, uh, and a standard set of alignments to make it basically easy access. It's, it's free access, everybody can get uh, at it. And what I'm trying to do is say, look, there's enormous amounts of information in these genomes which at the moment haven't really been investigated. Think, for example, of biomedical research where if you've got a low side that you're interested, I'll give you an example in a moment. The, the space and time information to track the genomic level changes for whatever thing you're interested in, in this information is enormous. Uh, I believe in the next month or so, another 70, or so, at the moment we've got um, 
70 ancient human genomes on there. A lot of the work that we've done with, with David and, and with Cambridge. Uh, we've got 62 ancient human microbiomes uh, up there at the moment um, from, from dental calculus is work we've done so far. We've got another 17 uh, genomes that we're working on with David that we expect to be available before too long. I hear that uh, Eski Willerslev is about to publish another 76 um, low coverage ancient human genomes. I mean, this data set is rapidly becoming enormous. And so your ability to go searching um, through space and time uh, is really very pronounced. And I think this is going to be a major new area is to start mining the, the information that at the moment is being used to study population admixture and movement, but for, for functional loci that might be of interest. And so I've just given an example here, P2RX7, which is a key self-surface receptor um, that one of the medics we work with is interested in. It's to do with uh, your inflammation response, and it's how you fight things like uh, intracellular pathogens, MTB. Uh, if you're um, deficient in this, you, you die very, very quickly if TB is around. But also toxoplasmosis, or leash mania. Um, the reason the medics are very interested in this is that um, by becoming very inflammatory, your, your response to these pathogens, to fight off TB and toxoplasmosa, you also make yourself very liable to multiple sclerosis. So the alleles which are most strongly um, protective against the pathogens also make you most strongly susceptible to having a false inflammation response inside the brain, which is what leads to multiple sclerosis. And so what we've done, the modern uh, wild type, which was, which was um, uh, haplogroup one here, that's, that's what's most dominant in the world today, was thought to be the, the standard version and they'd found very low copy numbers of, of these other two, three, and four haplotypes in modern populations, but they're incredibly rare, and they had various gain and loss of function um, derivatives. But they figured the wild type was really what it was all about. But if you go back through time, we've just quickly plotted at different periods of time all the ancient genomes that are available. There's enormous diversity of these alleles. The wild type is not the wild type. It's actually a very recent uh, invention. Uh, and you can see all the hunter-gatherers showing um, the, the very rare now haplotype 2. Uh, just, just giving you an example of, of how a modern loci um, can be completely reinterpreted when you start looking back. I suspect this period of time when you get all this diversity reflects the different populations that David is talking about moving into, into Europe and bringing in quite different alleles, very possibly associated with the pathogens that have been exposed to. So I'd like to say thank you very much to um, a huge number of people that are responsible uh, for the samples and the work that has gone on here. Uh, that too, too numerous to, to uh, list, just particularly all the lab group that's done the work. Uh, the very many museum curators who are incredibly generous in allowing us to grind up their invaluable specimens. Um, and then a huge host of collaborators, um, as Matthias commented, um, uh, David and co have been incredibly generous with their time and expertise. Uh, in, in generating these projects and our funding uh, all through the Australian Research Council. Uh, but, but thank you uh, to you as well for, for hanging out this long uh, in the afternoon to, uh, to listen to the talk. Thank you. Lots of differences in what way do you mean? Oh yeah, uh, so um, when I'm talking about an extinction, it's an entire uh, clade disappearing, and I'm only counting clades when they are like one of two, you know, when you've lost 50% of the diversity of, of the group. Um, about 50% of the examples I give are actually the last recorded time of any member of that species. Um, but uh, there's another about 30% of, of them are actually huge clay changes, but it's got to be massive. It's got to be across a very large area to count. Um, but I think one of the strengths of that argument is just how many species across how much space are showing that very staggered effect where each species is choosing its own time and place to have a crisis. It's not like one point happened and everybody got into trouble. And I think what you're, what you're seeing, or my interpretation of that, is, is almost that the climactic shifts are so regular and show, well, are so dramatic and come along so often that what you've evolved or forced upon the environment is, a, is a very much a meta-population structure. 
where you've got individual bits which are winking out all the time, little, little crises happening because of some impact of an interstate or that area, quickly then being infilled. And, we, and I didn't point that out, but in many cases, it, we know it's not taphonomic bias because I've got one species suddenly being replaced by exactly the same congener or, or conspecific. So it's not like we're run out of bone power to see anything happening. The bones are there, but they're now something completely different. And so I think that gives you a very different view about the landscape back in that period of time and perhaps how the ecosystem was set up to deal with these very dramatic climactic shifts. And I wonder that there's been so many of them, 26, 27 in, in, the, in the Pleistocene, that the species themselves have not come up with some pre-planned response. You know, after the third or fourth or fifth time you're getting whacked from this, you're starting to work out that turning on this suite of genes in cold conditions is a good idea. And you keep running that through. And whether that's an epigenetic response, you're turning on pathways as your, as your initial quick reaction, or whether you've actually got whole systems set up to deal with this, I don't know. But that's what we're looking at with the bison. We're measuring whole genomes at different points. We're trying to see when gene systems are turned off and on in response to an, an environmental shifts. And I think that'll be the first time that anyone showed the role epigenetics is playing in macroevolution. It's always been a possibility, but there's never been, well, in animals, plants, they don't even question it. It's just part and parcel of what goes on. Because there's so many genomes, you have to, have to silence them. But in animals, it's still like, no, no, no. It has to be traditional, you know, Mendelian, Darwinian selection, the whole standard bit. And so I think the, the, the permafrost is a really good test uh, case for that, if you get enough individuals in enough time frame. Um, probably not enough, I think we've got enough carnivores. We've got a couple of lions and a couple of bears. The carnivores by their nature, there's just not that many of them. So you don't have good carbon dating series. And so I have included many of the large carnivores because there's just not enough dating information. Um, we did try a number of, of simulations of differing subsets of the taxa, whether they were invasions or extinctions. Um, whether they were warm or cold adapted, so-called, which have been some way that had previously been suggested you can classify these different groups. And we found very little uh, way of binning the data in, in, in ways that made any, any predictive sense. It seemed to be very generalized. And that was one of the cri uh, criticisms of the reviewers was you wouldn't expect interstadial changes to actually be having uh, the same effect on all species. You know, it, it, in some places you're getting wetter, in some places you're getting drier. It entirely depends on the localised weather conditions what an interstadial is going to do to you. And so that's, I think, exactly why you would see this very staggered, diverse response. You're not going to see any one type in any one area necessarily being affected in the same way. But it really suggests, I think, that, that extinction, localised extinction and replacement is just a common phenomenon right the way through. And that cycling of population size might, might be a really key factor that we need to take into account when, when we're modeling demographically what, what populations are going through in time. If that's any indication, the humans, this is a proxy for humans, if you like, in a way. The humans are tracking some of these very same events. And I think one of our big problems with our models is just not having that kind of stochasticity in there about population size over time. Uh, certainly the animals are suggesting that's going on. Yeah. <laughs>